don't know me, I'm Ani Anderson. I'm the co-creator of Sensation-Based Motivation Coaching, and I'm really excited that you're here, whether you're live in person or watching the replay. So I've got to tell you, um, for me, this information is a little addictive because it is so incredibly helpful. I uh, literally wait for the opportunities when I can really be present and compassionate in the face of emotions. And I know that that sounds a little crazy, but when you get really good at it, you know that you can navigate any relationship. So whether you're a leader who wants to be better with your staff or you're a parent who wants to be better with your kids or your parents or your family um, or, or anything, it's really super helpful information for all, all walks of life. So I remember one of the first times where I was really in a relationship with somebody a client relationship where I was helping them to navigate difficult emotions. And it felt a little bit like being outside on a breezy day where the breeze was blowing around me and I felt like a grounded, tall, strong, centered tree. And while it was going on, I remember feeling a little uncertain about how it was going to go. And after I remember that my client said, that opportunity changed my life. That conversation changed my life. And it really did. I continued to work with her for a number of years, actually, after that conversation. And she's just never been the same person. She used to struggle with anger and she doesn't anymore. And um, this can really be super life-changing information. So I'm going to be passing the baton over to Brian here real soon. He's going to be bringing you some really exceptional content stick with us. You're going to want a piece of paper so that you can take some notes, but also know that this is being recorded and uh, the, the replay will be available so you can watch back. Brian is, you've probably heard me say this before, but one of my favorite things about Brian is his ability to take spiritually complex information and make it really simple and practical. So that's what, that's what you're in, in store for tonight. So uh, also just so you know, as part of this webinar presentation, a lot of times people ask us questions like, how can I get the manual? Where can I learn more? And uh, there's a great way to learn more and that's to work with us. So we have a program coming up soon and we're going to be letting you know about it in this presentation. So if you like this information, you can go deeper with it. Also stay till the end of the presentation for our live audience. I'm sorry, for those of you watching the recording, you're not going to get a chance to participate with us in this. But for our live audience, we're going to be doing some laser coaching. And if you haven't had the opportunity to do this with us before, it's super fun. And if you have, I hope you're excited. So stay to the end. We're going to do a little bit of laser coaching and help you see some of your blind spots. We're actually going to be doing some specific laser coaching tonight around asking really great questions. I might, Brian, have just given away a little bit of the punchline. I'm sorry. Um, before I hand it over to Brian, though, please make sure you open up your chat and say hello. We have an intimate live audience here tonight, so let's chat in the chat. People are still going to be coming into the presentation probably throughout the presentation, so we'll welcome them as they do. But pop, go ahead and uh, open up your chat and pop in. Tell us who you are, where you're from. You could even tell us what you're hoping to learn tonight. That would be really great. So with, uh, without further ado, let me pass it off to Brian. And I'm excited. I'm excited to learn about this uh, along with you, Brian. It's always fun. All right, cool. Thanks so much, Johnny. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. And thanks so much for being here, everyone, tonight. Um, if, if you haven't done a training with us before, you are in for a treat. And if you have done some training with us before, you are in for a treat. So it's going to be hopefully a really exciting um, hour or so for us together. It's got a lot of, we're packed with material. I love this information um, because I'll give a little bit away right now, because for those of you who, who have done some things with us before and see, seen us talk about stick man, you know, once we start talking about having difficult emotions or when other people get upset, we have to bring in two stick people. So now we start to talk about the interaction between two stick people instead of just always having one stick friend on the, on the screen. So let's go ahead and just jump right in, everybody. I'm going to pop on over and share our PowerPoint for this evening. Okay, now I can't see anybody on my screen, Ani, just to let you know. So if, um, if, if there's a question or something, or you need to just pop right in because I can't see any hands waving or anything like that, okay? All right. Here we go, gang. So we're going to talk about tonight about when people get upset, staying grounded and helpful in, every, in the face of every client interaction. 
Now, you're in the right place, gang, if, if you want to make a quantum leap in your impact, if you really want to be able to make a huge impact in other people's lives, as well as your own life, you're in the right spot. If you want to have a strong voice in every relationship that you're in, you're in the right spot. If you want to know your body as a source of wisdom rather than a source of agony, then you're in the right spot. And um, he, you know, if you want to be able to respond compassionately when other people get upset, that's what we're covering tonight. So welcome. Ani introduced us a little bit. I'm Brian Traskos. I'm here with Ani Anderson. We are the co-creators of cessation-based motivation coaching. And we both come out of the rehabilitation field. I was uh, trained as a physical therapist way back when. Ani has an occupational therapy degree. We're both body workers, energy medicine practitioners, um, you know, Qigong and Tai Chi um, teachers and, and practitioners and instructors and trainers. So we come out of the body-based paradigm and we paired that with our deep understanding of somatic psychology, mindfulness and neuroscience to come up with what we call sensation-based motivation coaching. And uh, we should be sharing that a little bit with, that, with you tonight, okay? Tonight's goals, everybody, here we are. We're gonna talk about how emotions are learned and not hardwired, right? So we learn emotions. Uh, to, we're gonna debunk the myth of emotional triggering tonight. And we're gonna talk about the three steps to staying grounded and effective when other people are upset. If you stay with us to the end, as Ani's saying, we're gonna do some laser coaching at the end. So make sure you hang in there with us and you can get some co direct coaching right for something that you're dealing with, which is the power of laser coaching. All right, let's hop in and talk about how emotions are learned. Now, before we talk about that, I'm gonna show you a picture. Now, maybe some of you have seen this picture before and maybe others of you have. Now, if you've seen this picture before, don't give it away, don't give it away. What I want you to think about if you've seen this picture before, that think about before you ever saw this picture, the first time that you saw this picture, and if you haven't seen this picture before, you might be looking at her and wondering what the heck that it is. So kind of look at it from a couple of different angles. Maybe kind of look at it from over here or over there. And you know, maybe, maybe you're wondering what that is. Now, this is an exercise in what we call construction. So if you don't know what this picture is, then check this out. Now look at it. And now look at it. So now you're looking at that same picture again, and what do you see there? So go ahead and pop that, you know, go ahead and pop that in the chat. What do you see now? Or was that too fast for folks? I am following the chat so I can see what's happening in there. So come in, someone uh, pop in there for me. What do you see? The B. Now, Janice, do you remember? I'll go back again here. All right, so now look. So it's obviously a B. And now look again. Do you see the B? So if you didn't see the B to begin with, but now you can see the B, what changed? The only thing that changed is that I gave you an image here on the left-hand side of this black and white photo so that your brain could construct the missing parts of the black and white photo. So if you compare these side to side, there's things that you can see in the color photo that don't show up in the black and white photo. So there's missing parts in that. Now, once your brain sees what the missing parts are, then all of a sudden, on, when you look at the black and white photo again, now your brain fills in those missing pieces so that now you can actually see the B as if it was always there, even though your brain couldn't construct it the first time. That's what we call construction. So that, there's different types of construction. There's psychological construction, there's social construction, and there's also emotional construction. So our emotions are constructed. And let's, so let's dive into this. So in, in order to kind of talk a little bit about how our emotions are constructed, we have to understand stick man. So I'm gonna pop into the uh, whiteboard and let's do a little stick man stuff. So a lot of you have seen us do stick man before, but so when we draw a stick person here with a half a head like that, it's because we're representing stick person between the ages of zero and seven. And between zero and seven, our brain waves are primarily what we call theta brain waves, between four and eight pulses per second, four and eight hertz. 
And the theta brain waves are the same brain waves that hypnotists use to hypnotize their subjects. Now, what that means is that the subconscious mind is wide open. There actually is no conscious mind yet before the age of seven. So the subconscious mind is wide open and the subconscious mind can only accept, so I'm gonna put an A in here, can only accept what is presented to it. So between the ages of zero and seven, everything we experience in our world is being dumped directly into the subconscious mind, like the mind is a fishbowl. And everything gets through. There's no blocks, there's no resistance to it, there's no, nothing at all to stop it from going in there. So between the ages of zero and seven, we're having a lot of conditioning and programming from everything that's going on in our outside world. So I always like to ask people just to pause for a second. And even if you've done this before, just pause for a second and think for a moment, what was your life like between the ages of zero and seven? What was your home life like? What was your school life like? Your parents, your siblings, your grandparents, your bedroom, your home. You know, um, what kind of issues were being dealt with at the time? What kind of problems were your parents experiencing? That, um, that you can remember? Were there money problems going on in your house? Were there relationship issues going on in your house? Um, was there political unrest going on in your house? I mean, what was going on in your world, especially things that you found maybe were difficult for you and for the people around you? Those are uh, some really great opportunities to learn from. All, all of that stuff's getting dumped into the subconscious mind without any type of barrier occurring to its being brought in, okay? Now, the subconscious mind, we just want to also know, runs our physiology gang. Our subconscious mind beats our heart, it breathes our lungs, it runs our liver, it runs our blood pressure, it runs our motor function, especially our postural function, especially if we're not thinking about it. So with my, with my conscious mind, I can reach over and grab a glass of uh, water. So I can certainly consciously use my muscles, but my subconscious is also running my muscles uh, oftentimes help me walk from A to B so that when I'm walking, I can think about other things. Or how about driving your car? Oftentimes we don't think about how we're driving our car. Our subconscious mind drives our car for us. So our subconscious mind is also running our body, gang. It's also running our body. I'm just kind of setting things, some things up here so we can go a little bit deeper with the understanding that between zero and seven, everything's coming in. We're soaking it like a sponge, soaking everything around us. It's, it's becoming our... Uh, belief systems is becoming our belief systems and our belief systems are all patterns, okay? And, it's, and those belief systems are becoming our physiology as well. They begin running our bodies. Now, how does that work? How does that work? Well, that works when we start thinking about what we call chakras, okay? So chakras. So chakras are, uh, of course, from the yogic tradition and uh, many people think that chakras are kind of amorphous uh, energy centers. Maybe they don't exist. Maybe they do exist. What, what's go are they kind of weird things? Well, actually, chakras have both anatomical and physiological um, actuality in our physiology. Chakras are associated with neural plexes. A neural plexes is a, if you have your spinal cord, and coming off of the spinal cord, we have 31 pairs of nerve roots coming off the spinal cord. Those nerve roots will come off and then they'll clump together into what we call neural plexi, so an, or a grouping of nerves before they go off into the body and then go off into all the little places. Now, when, since nerves are electrical, they're energetic. Electricity is energy. Nerves are electrical. You know, we know that from nerve, nerve uh, velocity, uh, nerve conduction velocity studies from EEGs, from EKGs, right? We know that nerves are electrical, so that when you have more density of nerves in the body, they have greater electrical capacity than little smaller nerves in the body. Now, there are six primary neural plexes in the body. We have what we call the pelvic plexus, which is right down in the bottom of the trunk. We have the sacral plexus. We have the solar plexus. We have the cardiac plexus, the cervical plexus, and the brain. And each one of these plexes is associated with uh, one of the chakras. So because of the way that we develop when we're very young, so we're babies, we're born, as, you know, as babies we're born, and then we start to go through neural development. 
we go from a period of time where we are learning how to get our thumb to our mouth, right? Or we're learning how to get our feet into our mouth. And then we go through a period of time where we're learning how to, how to uh, toilet, do bowel and bladder. And then we're learning where we're learning to crawl. And then we're learning to walk. And then we're learning to run. And then we're learning about, so, about our social interactions, about the groupings within our families. These are all the things that we're learning about as we develop. Now, that development requires neural activity, right? It requires neural activity to run our bowel and our bladder. It requires neural activity to get our hand into our mouth. It requires, and so we're talking about neuromuscular. It requires nerves and muscles working together. Now, because at certain stages of life, we're also receiving like a sponge from everything around us. We're receiving not only what's going on with our parents' actions, but what we're gonna find out in a moment, we're also being soaking up like a sponge what's going on with our parents' emotional states, how they're feeling. We know this actually starts in the womb all the way through, uh, all the way through seven years old and then beyond in some ways as well. <clears throat> But so just like we have physical development, we also have emotional development. And we know that there are certain uh, categories of emotions that are associated with different stages of neurological development. And, and they go also go along with the chakras. So the first chakra primarily develops between the womb and with 12 months or one year of life. And um, the emotion of fear is the emotion that's primarily associated with the first chakra development. Second chakra is guilt. Third chakra is shame, and the fourth chakra is grief, um, associated with where they are in the body. And, uh, and we could spend you know, months and months and months and months talking about specifically how that works. We don't have time to do all that tonight. We do that in another program that we're going to mention to you a little bit later on, if you're interested in learning more about that further. But we're just trying to, again, lay a groundwork for this right now. So let's also lay a groundwork for a second. Let's put Stickman to the side for a second. Let's just lay the groundwork of just one natural law tonight. Now, if you're not, not familiar with what a natural law is, a natural law is a natural process that occurs in the universe that has three primary um, elements associated with it. The first is that it's omnipresent. It's everywhere. There's nowhere that it's not. The second is that it's persistent and consistent, it happens all of the time, and it happens the same way all of the time. It never changes how it's happening. And the third element is that it's non-judgmental. It's that it doesn't really care what you think about it. We can't manipulate, coerce, shame, guilt, a natural law into changing. Natural law doesn't care what we think about it, it just keeps going along doing its thing, kind of like gravity does, right? We could, we could hate gravity and it's gonna, gravity is gonna do the same thing that it would do if we loved gravity. Gravity is just gonna keep doing what it's doing. We're going to talk about one natural law tonight, which is the natural law of vibration. There are seven primary natural laws, but the law of vibration is one we really, really need to uh, talk about tonight when we're talking about emotions, okay? Ani, if we get any really great questions that pop into the chat, just go ahead and just jump in and let me know, or feel free to hang them on to them for a little bit later when we do, uh, when we, when we do a little break from the teaching. Okay, so natural law of vibration. Now, Everything in the universe vibrates, folks. We have to know that as a law for self. We think about quantum physics. Uh, atoms, electrons, protons, uh, whirring around, neutrons, everything in the universe vibrates. Okay, so that's a law of the universe, a law of nature. We know that now. I'm vibrating, you're vibrating, this cup is vibrating. Everything is vibrating. Even if it looks like it's solid, it's still vibrating. And that's everything. Everything is vibrating. So when I say everything, I mean everything. Okay, everything. Now, different things vibrate at different frequency patterns. That's how we can tell them apart. So my body is vibrating at a different frequency than this mug. That's why, that's why I'm not ceramic and this mug is ceramic. Okay, so ceramic vibrate at different frequency than, uh, than, than physical cells, vibrating at different frequency than plastic. So things that vibrate at different frequencies look different. That's how we can tell them apart. Now, things that vibrate at the same frequencies tend to become what we call entrained. Okay, they become entrained with one another. So when you have two things, it's like tuning forks. When you have a tuning fork vibrating and you bring another tuning fork near it, you have both those tuning forks to start vibrating at the same frequency. Now they become entrained. And they become entrained in all elements of whatever is encased within that frequency pattern because 
things that are vibrating are patterned frequencies and there can be many things contained within those patterns, okay? Think about a radio for a second, a radio wave. So if I tune my radio right now to 107.9, I would pick up NPR in my area. And so as I, as I um, decode the, the VPR NPR station coming into my radio, it's resonating at 107, at 107.9 pulses per second, and then it's contained with all this information. Now, if I go to uh, 90.9, I don't even know what that station is, I'm just guessing for a second, but if I go to 90.9, I'm gonna get a different thing. Let's say I'm gonna get classic rock. Now, it's a different frequency, it's a different frequency pattern, and therefore contains different information. But the idea is, is that when you have two things vibrating and they're vibrating at the same frequency, they become entrained with one another and then they become connected in, in some way. Now, a lot of people talk about this in terms of what we call the law of attraction. Now, the law of attraction has some um, misnomers. We're not really attracting something when we're vibrating at the same frequency we are. We are revealing it because everything in the universe is vibrating, right? I mean, the vibe, the vibe if, if you, you're looking out your window right now and everything out there is vibrating. And what we're gonna talk about in a moment is the only reason you can recognize something as a certain vibration is because you've been trained to see it that way. But if you weren't trained to see it that way, if there were no filters on our bringing information into the system, then everything would just like go like a blur of vibration. It would be a mess. Now our cells, our sensations, thoughts, and emotions are things, folks, they're things, and therefore vibrate at specific frequencies. Yes, our cells vibrate at specific frequencies, our sensations vibrate at specific frequencies, and different sensations have different frequencies, that's how we tell them apart. Our thoughts have different frequencies, our emotions have different frequencies. And what we already talked about is all information travels on frequencies. Now this is just a little bit about the law of vibration that we really need to understand tonight. Okay, now let's go back to stick person on, uh, well, we can actually do it right here. Now, after the age of seven, after the age of seven, if you notice now on this stick person, there's a cap on the subconscious mind. The, and the conscious mind comes into play after the age of seven, where we start to experience what we call alpha and beta brain waves. And once the conscious mind caps the subconscious, that we have this line down the middle of the conscious mind here, the conscious mind kind of ha now has two basic modes. It can either what we, what we call accept information that comes into the subconscious or it can reject information that it doesn't want in the subconscious. Because the fact is gang, everything that is operating in our subconscious mind, whether it's our individual subconscious mind or it's our collective subconscious mind, gives us the results that we get in the world. And that's what this basically shows here, is that the results are programmed in the subconscious. BVH means beliefs and values and habits, which become our body and our body then takes actions. And then from those actions, we create results, circumstances, and experiences. Now, those results, circumstances, and experiences are, built, are, are fed back into our senses. Now, this is the important part. We've got this radio antenna coming out of the subconscious mind. What this radio antenna represents are our senses, our sight, taste, touch, smell, sound, or our interoceptive senses, the senses that are inside of our body. In our inside of our body, we have sensors that pick up information and that bring that information to the brain. So that when you have a stomach ache, you know, it's not, something's not happening from the outside, something's happening on the inside, but your, there are sensors around your stomach that are bringing interoceptive information into your brain so your brain can then make sense of it and then make a decision on it. So again, we're just talking about a basic physiological process right now in terms of how this works. Okay, so hopefully that's making sense so far. Um, you know, maybe I'll just pop out just for a second right now. Um, are there any, do we have any questions in the chat? Not yet. I think you have this. a lot of rapt attention. So I know we're going through a lot of information tonight so that you can really understand uh, where we're going. So please go ahead and pop some, pop some questions if you have any into the chat and uh, we'll uh, answer some of those. Okay. Yeah, I know we're going through some stuff kind of, kind of quick, but it's going to come together here in just a moment. Okay, so now let's, here's our second, yay, here's our second stick person. So 
here we have a mama stick per or a papa stick stick person and a baby stick person. Now you'll notice that the baby stick person, as we talked about before the age of seven, has a fishbowl subconscious so that everything's going directly in and there's no filtering available, okay? Everything goes right in. Now on the adult, we have a conscious mind, conscious mind, and the conscious mind has the capacity to either accept or reject information coming into it. But this is what we want to point out here, gang, is that as children, there's an old saying that children won't do what you say, it will do what you do. And I think for the parents out there, is that true? Maybe we should ask that question in the chat. Does that make sense as parents? That your kids don't do what you say, they do what you do. And that sometimes can be kind of a hard nut to swallow, but it, it is the absolute truth and this is why. Because remember, kids are completely subconscious. They are, have, they're learning everything from theta brainwave states. They're not having alpha brainwaves, they're not having beta brainwaves. So kids are not conscious. They're not conscious. So we can tell them something, you know, and we have a rational uh, process in our head of why they shouldn't do X, Y, or Z. Like don't stick your finger in the light socket because of X, Y, and Z. But they're, they're, they can't even compute that. They can't compute it because their conscious mind isn't even working yet. So what they're doing is soaking everything up subconsciously. And that's why kids primarily learn vibrationally, not cognitively. Between the ages of zero and seven, kids are not learning cognitively, they're learning vibrationally. So kids are not learning what, they're learning how. That's the key thing you wanna remember here. Kids are not learning what you say, they're learning how you say it. So that's what they're paying more attention to. And the how, and this is how the parent is talking, how the parent is behaving, how the parent is reacting, how the parent is proacting, how the parent is talking, how the parent is doing everything. That's what the child is soaking up, all of the hows. And so they're soaking up all of the ethics and morals and beliefs and constructs and everything and anxieties and fears and angers and joys and sadnesses, right? That's what the child is literally like a sponge soaking all that up from the parent's subconscious, not from the conscious. That's why the arrow goes from the parent's subconscious to the child's subconscious because the child can't learn from a conscious mind yet because they don't have a conscious mind themselves. Does that make, does that, was that make, does that make sense for folks? Okay, hopefully, hopefully we're all on the same track here. Are we all still here? Let me just get a couple of yeses from the chat. Okay, so Max is there, Janice is there, great. Okay, cool. Fantastic. All right, so kids are learning subconsciously and they're learning the hows from the parents, okay? And this, this vibrate, and this is a vibrational frequency too. I wanna to be very clear about that. It's a vibrational frequency because emotions are vibrations. Emotions are vibrations. Let's just talk about that now. And perceptual filters. So if you notice on this last slide, we had the filter here. This is the, what we say filter. The subconscious mind is a filter. And this is how a child learns what a, you know, basically constructs their filter. So again, when I said, look outside, I'm looking outside right now, I'm seeing some trees. Now, the only reason that I identify those as trees is because I already have a template in my brain for tree. Remember the B exercise we did at the beginning of tonight's training? We you know where it looked like a blob first, and then I showed you that it was actually a B, and then I showed you the blob again and it looked like a bee, that's the same way it works. So you, we've really quickly constructed a, a filter so that the bee can be identified. So this is how a filter is constructed. An emotional filter is constructed because a child has learned emotional vibrations from the subconscious mind of the parent. 
And this is what I want to say about filters. Now, if you have a flashlight, and a flashlight is white light. So white light contains all of the visible light in the, in the spectrum, right? Roy G. Bib, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Now, if you shine a white light through a red filter, the red filter blocks out all of the white light except for the wavelength of red. So light is a vibrational frequency. Remember, all information travels on frequencies. So if I'm on this side of the filter, all I see is red coming from that white light. So this is just how a filter works, by the way. And so we basically have these filters just like this. So Lisa Feldman Barrett, in her book, How Emotions Are Made, said, in every waking moment, your brain uses past experience organized as concepts. So concepts can be beliefs, they can be um, ideas, but think of, concepts can also be beliefs. So think about like that, but, and beliefs are patterns. So organize the concepts or beliefs to guide your actions and give your sensations meaning. Remember we talked about what comes from internally. So emotions are obviously an internal experience. They're an internal experience. And what we're gonna find out in just a second is all emotions are actually rooted in sensations. So in every waking moment, your brain uses past experience to organize this concepts to guide your actions and give your sensations meaning. If you didn't have concepts that represent your past experience, all of your sensory inputs would just be noise. So again, think about that blob B that we saw right at the beginning. If you didn't have a filter already for that blob to make sense, that's, if we didn't have any filters, that's what all of life would be like. It would always be like that, including our internal sensations. It would be, we'd be experiencing internal, interoceptive sensations, but we would have no way to make any meaning of it. You wouldn't know what the sensations are, what caused them, nor how to behave to deal with them. So in this way, with what we're saying here, gang, is that the subconscious mind is necessary for our creation and organization of reality because it acts as the primary filter or template for what we experience as our reality. If we didn't have that filter in our subconscious mind, everything would just be complete noise, chaos, randomization. There would be no organization to it. That's a big part of what our subconscious mind does, okay? So let's talk about how an emotional pattern is constructed. So as a young child, as a child, we experience a sensation inside of our body. Now, let's say uh, that sensation was associated with something being taken away from us, okay? Or maybe we're being punished for something. Let's say we're being punished. Let's say we, um, we, did, we stuck our, fing our, our finger in a light socket. Now, our parents care about us, right? They love us, but your parents might freak out and be like, get out of the light socket, what are you doing? You're, or go pull you away from the light socket. Now, we don't know that the light socket is dangerous as a child. All we know is that our parents are afraid and, and maybe angry. And so when they're afraid and they're angry and they become more vigorous with us than we had anticipated, you know, the child has some sensations inside of their physiology. Now, they don't know what the heck those sensations mean, but they just know they experience something physiologically, and the sensations probably weren't comfortable. Now, along with those sensations instantaneously, though, they capture the meaning from outside. The meaning from outside from the parent is, of course, whatever the parent's saying, but also how they're saying it, right? How they're saying it. They could be saying, um, you know, never do that again. You scared the heck out of me. You can't do that. Or they might say you're a bad boy or girl, or they might say, I don't know what they're going to say, but they're going to say something, but they're going to have an emotion associated with it. And now the meaning, the meaning that, that they are expressing from their subconscious is being paired with the sensation that's occurring inside of the child. Okay. Inside of the child. And that's how we create an emotion. Emotions are sensations plus what we call thoughts. And thoughts being the meaning of the sensation, the categorization of the sensation, the way we label the sensation, that create, that becomes an emotion. So how do you know when you're angry? You know when you're angry because you have a sensation in your body that someone else taught you was anger. And here's the thing, gang, different cultures experience emotions differently. 
there are some cultures that don't even experience anger. There are other cultures like ours that have a very high investment in anger. Certain cultures, when someone passes away, they have, there's only joy that flows. Other cultures, when people pass away, it's a requirement to experience sadness for six months. So, you know, what, what is going on with that? It's because we learn emotions primarily from our biopsychosocial constructs. But an emotion is created from a sensation plus a thought. And that's also why our, or, or because our subconscious mind tells our conscious mind again, how to think about what we're experiencing in our sensations. So emotions are constructed folks. Emotions are not pre-programmed into us. Not everyone doesn't experience emotions the same way. Emotions are constructed within us based on our past life experiences and the way our behavioral and belief constructs were set up, primarily before the age of seven years old. Now it can happen afterwards after that as well. Okay, how are we doing out there with uh, thoughts or questions? Ani, do you have any thoughts you wanna to add to where we are right now? I just love this material so much. And every time I hear it, I think about my own upbringing and how much fear I must have been programmed um, for in my own life and to look at out there in the world and see how much fear there is out there. I have a lot more compassion for people and what they're going through, um, knowing that most of us were probably programmed with a lot of fear because our kids do things like stick their fingers in light sockets, you know? So um, just, a, just a little personal reflection for me. Yeah, and that's great, Ani. Thank you. And this, hopefully this also, gang, will maybe start to make, uh, as we go into the next section, Help us understand that when you have you, if you have been partnered with someone in your life, that, that you probably don't experience emotions all the time the same way that they do. Now, but there are probably some emotional overlaps that do exist as well. Have you ever been in an experience with someone where they're experiencing an emotion and you're like, I, I, I don't even know what's, what's going on over there. Like, I have no clue what's happening. I, I, and then have you otherwise, have you also had experiences where someone's experiencing an emotion and you get completely thrown off your rocker? Has that ever happened for anybody? So if, if that's happened, let's talk, about, let's talk about that now. Because you know what a lot of people like to say is, I was what? What's the famous word that people say? I was triggered. Okay, they say I was triggered. Well, let's debunk that right now. Let's debunk emotional triggering, okay? First, let's talk about our perceptual filters again, folks. So remember, just remember, if you have white light coming from this direction and it contains all of the information available in light, in visible light, and I'm on this side and all I see the red, what I'll think, what I will believe is that the only aspect of visible light is red light because that's my direct experience with it, okay? That's my direct experience with it. That's how a filter works. So when we're talking about how we function as adults after the age of seven, this is what we call a result, a circumstance, or an event or an experience that's happening in our life, a result, circumstance, or experience. So that experience could be, you know what, an, an election result. It could be a sporting result. It could be that, um, you know, a, a pretty uh, result that people talk about a lot is there's never enough money in the bank account at the end of the month. So that's a financial result. Or it could be a relationship result. Why do I keep getting into the same relationships again and again and again? Why do every time we get in a relationship, we have the same, um, same problem with the person again and again and again? So has that ever happened to anybody? Probably, probably if you've had more than a couple of relationships that you've been in your life. So, so that's a result again and again and again. So the result gets fed back to us. Now it gets fed back to us, remember, and our spidey senses here are fed into our subconscious mind. And so what's happening is this result, this result, as it comes back to us, believe it or not, is white light. It has all of the possibilities available to us. 
So this, this result here that comes back to us with every relationship you've been in, with your financial results, with your health results, whatever it is, has red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and blue, violet. It has all of the information available to you. However, your subconscious mind will filter out only the thing that has been programmed to filter. So the, and this does this vibrationally. It does it vibrationally because our subconscious mind is, has beliefs and programs vibrating in it. Remember, uh, everything vibrates. So these programs in our subconscious mind are vibrating at a specific frequency and they're vibrating like a filter. So they're filtering out only what they have been programmed to filter. They can't filter anything else out. So what does this mean in relationships? So now again, we have two stick people. So let's say that you know, you're the stick person over here on the left and there's somebody else over here on the right. And this person over here on the right is experiencing an X vibration. They are, um, they're upset, okay? So they're angry or they're afraid or, they're, um, or something's going on, but they are having an emotional issue going on over here on the right side. And, you know, this could be you and it could be someone else on the other side, by the way, too. But let's just, just for this example, let's, let's go with this one. So they're having something going on over here and they're vibrating at an X frequency. Let's say the X frequency is, let's say it's, um, let's say it's anger, just for instance. So they're, they're vibrating the X frequency of, of anger over here. Now, they might be saying why. They might be saying, oh, it's fine. I'm okay. There's not a problem, right? I'm not angry. So Y is a different frequency than X. So the X is the, vib frequency, the vibrational frequency of anger that's happening in their subconscious and in their body. So it kind of looks like this. No, I'm good. No, I'm not angry. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. That's no, okay. It's fine. Right? That's what, I'm, that's what I'm kind of talking about sort of thing. So they're telling you with their conscious mind they're fine, but obviously they're not fine from their subconscious mind. Now, your spidey senses, your antenna, are going to pick up because your spidey senses feed directly into your subconscious. They're picking up what's happening in the subconscious material of the other person, not the conscious material. Just like when we were kids. Okay, just like when we were kids. But here's the thing, gang. If you've ever been in a, in a relationship with somebody, and they're having an emotional issue, and it doesn't even connect with you, you're like, I don't even know what you've got going on over there. I don't even know what you're experiencing over there. That's because you don't have a filter for that vibration. On the other hand, if someone else is having an emotional issue, and you're feeling it in your system, and it's making you unsettled, and making you upset, and making you ungrounded, the reason that is because you already have that vibrational frequency in your subconscious mind, which is your body, by the way, too. Let's just point that out, right? Your subconscious mind is your body. Remember, your subconscious mind runs your heart, runs your lungs, runs your liver, all the, the muscle tone runs, everything in your physiology. So your subconscious mind is your body. And that's why you feel it in your body. So when someone else is upset, you feel it in your body because the, you because you're directly filtering subconscious to subconscious that vibrational experience. Now, just like with kids, remember when kids get a, what we call a, a conflicting message like this as a parent, a parent might say, I'm not angry at you, but they really are. The kid picks up that they are angry. And then the lesson that the kid will learn as their vibrational frequency is to experience an emotion and then lie about it or hide it, or suppress it. So that's actually what we're teaching our child. So we can't fool our kids, gang. Like what we're experiencing internally is actually what's being transmitted to our kids because they're soaking it up like a sponge as a subconscious mind. And so that's, then they're gonna be dealing with those very similar things as they get older. I, so I take this with a huge load of compassion, such as what Ani said, because what I have uh, realized as I've grown up, that what I've experienced as an adult is probably in very high proximity what my parents experienced as adults. 
And so, you know, as a kid, I think as a young adult, it's really easy to judge your parents or, or not forgive them for things that they might have done or said. And then as you get older, and I started to experience what they experienced, I was like, oh, I get that now. And I start to understand that a little bit more. But, so, but this is how it works. So if you're feeling ungrounded, know gang, that you're not being triggered. Because being triggered means that someone else did something, like pulled a trigger, right? So the gun's here, it shoots from here, but the effect happens over there. That's not how it works with emotions. Really with emotions, what the emotion is doing is being revealed, not being triggered, it's being revealed and activated. Because for us to experience something inside of ourselves in association with someone else, we must already first have that vibrational frequency already present. All right, just gonna pop out of here for a second. How are we doing? Ani, you have any thoughts? I'm just remembering some of the times as a, a life partner, you and I have had this experience where, well, usually I'm the one having an emotional thing go on and you don't have any real filter concept about um, what's going on with me. I, uh, when I was listening to you say that we, we basically like get it because we have the filter, I can imagine that some people would think, well, I want to get rid of as many filters as possible. <laughs> But it's actually really wonderful when you are a sensitive person who experiences emotions because you can understand where a lot of people are coming from. So when we understand how to recognize that we have patterns and deconstruct those patterns, then the filters become a blessing instead of a curse. <laughs> Yeah, 100%, 100% 100 agreeing. And remember, people have some questions, just go ahead and pop them in the chat. I'm happy to answer those. But, so just to round up where we are right now, folks, emotions are constructed, right? So we learn emotions, just like we learn everything else. We learn what sensations mean. And then we create filters and templates to re-experience those emotions again and again and again and again in our lives. Now, if someone else is experiencing that same emotion, we pick it up because remember, when things vibrate at the same frequencies, they tend to entrain to one another. They tend to entrain to one another. This is a really important thing to remember. And it's what, whoever is most consistently vibrating becomes the prairie entrainer. That's a really important thing to, to recognize. So it's whoever's vibrating most consistently at that frequency becomes the entrainer of the parties. So if you've got two people with the same filters, whoever's got whatever vibration is going the most often, most consistently, the most stubbornly, if you will, right? They, become, they will become the primary uh, tuning fork, if you want to think about it like that. All right. Now remember, hang in there to the end, and we've got some Let's go on to the three steps to staying grounded and effective when people get obsessed. So here are the three steps, everybody. The first step is you must accept what is actually happening inside of you. The second step is confidently shift your physiologic patterns. You, know, you have to know how to confidently shift your physiologic patterns. The third is to ask accurate vibrational questions. So these are the three ways to stay grounded and effective. Let's go through each of these. So the first one is to accept what is actually happening inside of you. Now, the problem with this is that most people suppress, try to hide, or project their feelings. Hey, Ani, if you have, uh, if you have any thoughts around this, just go ahead and jump right in. Because again, I can't, um, I can't see anybody else on my screen at the moment. Sure. So this is kind of what we were talking about a little bit, gang, is that it, how many of you have done this before? How many of you have been feeling a certain way and then tried to suppress it or hide it because you didn't want the other person to know or tried to keep your stuff together, right? The problem is the person that you're in relationship with, they know because they're feeling it subconsciously. They're already feeling it subconsciously. And so when we say one thing, but we're feeling another way, that actually sets up a large degree of distrust, believe it or not. Now, the person that we're communicating with doesn't know why they don't trust you, but they just know they don't trust you because they know that you're not being in integrity. And you've done this for other people too. You've talked with people and they're telling you something 
but you're like, it doesn't, it's not in alignment. It does, it's not landing. It doesn't sound like it's really all there. You don't know why, but you're sensing it. That's what's happening because you're sensing a disintegrity between what's happening in their conscious mind and in their subconscious mind. And you're feeling it on a vibrational level. So the first thing we have to do is accept what's happening inside of us. The second thing we have to do is confidently shift our physiologic patterns. Now, the problem here is that most people become confused, armored, or go blank when we start to experience those discomforting and uncomfortable feelings in our physiology. They often, oftentimes hijack us and we become, we just go like, what's going on? I don't understand. Or I, or I don't know what to say, or I don't know what to do. Or we armor up, right? We armor up and get stiff. So we don't, we try not to feel it sort of thing. Um, this is what happens. And so when we're caught in this, we're not staying grounded and effective when other people get upset. We're actually getting sucked into their vibrational frequency. We're getting sucked into their vibrational drama. Now, the third thing we have to be able to do is to be able to ask accurate vibrational questions. Remember again, gang, everything vibrates, everything vibrates, including questions. Questions have a vibrational frequency. And inside of every question, there is a equivalent vibrational answer. So we need to ask questions that are associated with the answer that we want to get. But that can't happen unless we can first accept what is actually happening inside of us, and second, confidently shift our physiologic patterns. We can't just jump to that higher level question because if we do, it'll look like this. What the hell is wrong with me? Like, that's the question we'll ask. Like, I'll start to feel all out of source. I'm like, what the hell is wrong with me? What kind of question, what kind of answer am I gonna get if I ask that question? I'm gonna get a question, a whole long list of things about what's wrong with me. And I can tell you what, that's not gonna be helpful at all. Has that question, how many of you have asked that question? And has that question ever yielded positive results, right? What, what the heck's wrong with you? So we have to learn how to ask accurate vibrational questions, but this is based on the vibrational frequencies that we confidently shift in our physiologic patterns, okay? Now, the problem here is that most people try to convince others to feel differently or to fix the problem. So instead of asking questions, we're trying to convince people, we're telling them what's right or wrong, we're telling them what's good or bad, we're trying to coerce them. Or we don't realize we're doing those things, but that's what most people try to do. Instead of asking a higher level question to get a different vibrational answer. Different vibration.